Welcome to Nothing Is Real, a podcast about the Beatles. Everybody thinks they know the Beatles, but how much do we really know? I'm Jason Carty. I'm Stephen Cockcroft. And we're live on tape from Dublin. If I remember it rightly, what they did was they put out 62 to 66 on CD and 67 to 70, and then they did live at the BBC, and then they did anthology. Yeah. Yeah. And all those things, you see the return of the Apple logo on records and the Apple logo returns onto the CDs that EMI put out in the 80s and all that that kind of stuff. So yes. they're, they're kind of building ahead of steam towards the anthology. Yes. Um, I have very fond memories of the anthology because that was the one time I got to experience a new Beatles single and I will defend Free as a Bird to the bitter end and we've had long... I'm, yeah, <laughs> I'm, 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 I, Jason is a big Jeff Lynn fan. Mm-hmm. I'm not, not so keen on the production <laughs> side on that single, but I actually prefer Real Love as a, mm, as a, yeah. as a, as a record, perhaps yeah. not as a song, but as... as, as I think it's closer to the... Uh, well, there's a new mix of Real Love that's appeared in the last two or three yes. years, which is a... I don't know. I'm not exactly sure how it has come to mm. surplant the other one, but it's mm. an even better thing. It's a yes. fantastic mix. That yes, I, I, I don't know anything about why yeah. that was done, but yeah, it, it, I, I enjoyed that too. And it done yeah. with very little fanfare. Yeah. I mean, just suddenly it appeared that it was there yeah. and you suddenly hear something different and you think, oh, they've, well, they've actually changed. Yes. Changed it significantly, yeah. but, but no fanfare at all. Yeah, I was really thrilled with both Free as a Bird and Real Love, mm. personally. Yeah. And, um, but I know they're not... They, they, Jeff Lynne's production wasn't everyone's cup of tea yeah. on that. I mean, that, that drum sound in no. particular. But <laughs> it's still the three of them. And they didn't spoil anything. No. Which was brilliant yeah. to actually achieve all that and not spoil anything. And from my own point of view, um, they had little liner notes on the picture bags of those two singles. And they were by me. Mm. So it's the new Beatles single. And the last Beatles single that had come out, <laughs> real Beatles single, was Let It Be. Mm-hmm if you exclude reissues, um, which I was still at school, just started secondary school. And here's the next one. It's 25 years later, and my name's on it, and I was very pleased about that. I can can imagine. imagine. (laughs) I hadn't realized that. That, That's that's amazing. Yeah. And the the, the anthology for me was the high watermark of my years with Apple. Mm. So the anthology grew out of this long and winding road that had, as I understand it, had initially, Neil Aspinall had started gathering stuff in the early 70s. 70. And had been putting a warehouse together of clips and securing rights and seeing what was out there and getting best processes mm. with their with their complete approval i mean okay. it, it was a it was an apple project that just never happened in the beatles time it was a 1970 is there a version of the long and winding road somewhere in a vault like is there an edit uh, yes well even better it's circulating oh, un- I unofficially I haven't, Have I, I haven't seen it but i know it's circulating oh there is um i don't i don't maintain in my head the names of all the bootleg labels but there is a bootleg <laughs> dvd label that put it out about Three years ago, oh, I didn't, I didn't you can you can buy it down by. down the marketplace. Uh, have, did you see it on as a bootleg, or how, did you see it prior to as part of the anthology? I maybe? saw it. I actually watched it with Neil with <laughs> Neil Aspel in Apple in 1991, and um, we just watched it on a little screen. Uh, it was Jeff Wanfer who would go on to direct mm. the Beatles anthology? Yeah. A lovely woman called Nell Burley who was at Apple, who was the at the start of the anthology, but didn't live to see it through. Um, Neil and me and we watched it at Apple and I made notes of the entire content of it and Neil looked at me and went what are you making those notes for <laughs> and I just, I just need to record what I'm seeing here alright what are you going to do with that nothing nothing oh, don't just, worry don't just worry. to have it <laughs> yeah um, and that, that, that presumably is the version that Harrison would have shown to Eric Idle yes I know you're a, Ruttle, a Ruttles fan big yes big. so are we yes. 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 big big Ruttles fan yes um, but was that a specific screening that George arranged that yes. specifically? And yes, it may have only just been in an office somewhere. Mm. But Neil, uh, Eric Idle definitely did see Neil's Long and Winding Road in its early edit form. And can mm. you tell, having seen them both, the Ruttles yeah. film, you can see the parallels where he's he's just lifting. Yes, yeah, the classic Beatles film clips, yeah. like um, like from the Mersey Sound film of Ringo, you know, walking through the hairdressing salon, yeah. which becomes Barry yes. walking through the salon in Redditch. Uh, yes, of course, that came from from uh, Eric seeing that. And would, would would George, Ringo, John, Paul, would they have been seeing rough cuts as that was being developed? Do you think, or I don't know. It was just a general sort of imprimatur to to Neil Aspinall. You you do this, and you 
I don't actually know in the end why it stalled mm. because he was certainly working on it. It was Neil's focused project for at least a year and there were people working on clearing rights and bringing footage yeah. in. So a lot of work was done, but Apple in the early 70s was probably a very difficult place to get things through because mm. of Alan Klein and because it's got four owners, but one of them is not is disagreeing with the other three quite fundamentally on everything. So... Um, yeah, it just kind of fell in between the cracks. But the anthology was a brilliant project, and mm. every in every way, I think. And and so when you're getting from ninety one to ninety five, when it comes out, uh, it, it, I know Jeff won for. I think he had done the Flowers in the Dirt documentary with yeah. Paul. Yeah, and uh, so he had been brought in to 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 do his piece. Uh, and then what? It's after that that there's interviews going on, and Jules Holland is brought in, and all these other. As I remember it, the, the first anthology interviews f- with the Beatles were from 92. Okay. And I would love to have been involved in those, but I wasn't. Um, and that was principally because George said he didn't want me mm. to do it. So they had Jules. Not that I would have necessarily been very good at it anyway at that time. But yeah. Jules Holland did some. I'm not sure. he. I don't think he did them all because Bob Smeaton. Yes. Think, yes, he, uh, I think he did, did the most first of them. raft. And then mm. the whole anthology, I mean, I... I uh, I was like every Beatle fan. I I adored the anthology project when when it came out. But with hindsight, you can see the compromises between uh, the, the principles. Yes. So it's uh, Jeff Wanfer is Paul's man. Jeff Lynn is George's man. Jeff Emmerich is Paul's mm. man. Mm. And you can see them trading. It's almost like children in a playground mm. picking members of a team exactly that. Uh, <laughs> I'll, you, I'll, I'll have him, him and you yeah. can have yeah and, I, was, and, I was Paul's pick yeah and <laughs> I wasn't George's pick yeah yes mm. um, so you don't necessarily end up with the best team no. you end up with a compromise team mm. and then that sort of mm. possibly feeds through into a compromise project anthology I think is, is, is excellent but again partly because of tune in you look at it and you think I want to see more of that or I want to know more detail about that or I mm. want that interview to be a little longer or a little yes. deeper but I just think that the politics uh, fascinates me almost as much as the music yeah. uh, we were having this conversation beforehand about uh, what it says about their personal relationships and, and uh, I just think the anthology is a very good example of that trade off, mm. that compromise I don't know if Ringo really has any his his people involved in that. It just it, obviously it was Paul and George it at was. that point. I mean, Ringo had to be happy with the choices, mm, mm. and I think I think they all knew Jeff Wanford. I don't think it was just Paul, um, but he probably was Paul's pick. Yeah. Probably um, there was a man called Rick Ward who who did the design for the anthology, including the albums and CDs and uh, and DVDs eventually, and that he was George's pick. Okay. Mm-hmm. So yeah, there were. It was. I'll have him. So I'll have him. And I know that um, uh, George didn't want me on it and argued with Paul about it and didn't want Jeff Emmerich either. But that was another one that Paul pushed through. Well, I can understand the Jeff Emmerich. Mm. Having read Jeff Emmerich's book, I could understand why <laughs> George wouldn't. I mean, I, I was. Well, George wasn't. Jeff wasn't so anti George in those days, mm. but it was because he was on the receiving end of a lot of fairly strong assaults, verbal assaults from George that he hit back in his book. Okay. All oh, right. It, okay. it didn't. It, it started with George, that one. W- during the anthology project? Or oh, earlier. Earlier. Earlier, okay. yeah. And, and I mean, I, when George. I, I, I once heard. George Martin, George Harrison, really ripping into Jeff Emmerich at George Martin's house to George Martin, and George Martin was going, "Oh no, 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 no! You got it all wrong about Jeff. Jeff's not like that, you know." But George had, he was unshiftable in his mm. opinions. George, mm. unshiftable, and one of them was me, yes, and another one was Jeff Emmerich, and they were based on little or nothing, yeah. But they were there, and they could not. They be weren't going to shift. No, no. no. And the anthology sort of has that. Once again, Beatles' happy accident of timing, that it comes out at the right time. There's a revival in British music, Britpop at the time. Mm. It's still this. When, when I saw that bounty of stuff coming through on the telly, it's like, well, there was no YouTube. It was just the right time to see all of that stuff. Ten yeah. years later would have been too late. Yes. And it was perfect timing to yes. to, to, to get that out. Um, in, in the production of it, 
I'm always fascinated by the moments when the three of them are together. Mm-hmm. R- did you have any experience of being in the same space with the three of them at any point no, in time? No, 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 no. They were closed sessions and I certainly wasn't welcome. Even though I was well on the team, I was yeah. involved in all aspects of the anthology, but, you know, you still you still get shut out of the door at certain occasions. Do you find, I find those bits fascinating to watch with the three of them, particularly mm-hmm. when they're you know that scene where they're sitting in George's garden and mm. Ringo says I love hanging out with you guys mm. that that bit gets me in the throat because yes, <laughs> yes. I think Ringo is particularly earnest and they're trying to be together and there's certain stuff they just can't get over it seems mm. uh, I don't know do you feel that or do you notice that in, in at that time when, you, when you'd see the footage of the three of them yeah yeah um, I do and George and Paul they there's an issue between them mm. unquestionably through all the times that they're filmed together for the anthology and I know that they were arguing as well uh, on those days or having strong disagreements but I wasn't present so I don't really know but um, there's another very strange necessary that they did they had to do the anthology they did have to do it again it's this idea of compromise yes they they, they each had George it was financial perhaps Paul Mm. Paul loves legacy it's a legacy thing a reclaiming yeah, something perhaps. Um, so they each had, for their own reasons, had to compromise. They did, and yes, yeah. I know. I, one of my favourite memories of the anthology is um, Paul used to hold Buddy Holly Week parties in, right, yeah. in London every September, usually on the seventh, which was Buddy's date of birth. And um, when would this be? Ninety. Five, probably 95 with the anthology just weeks away because didn't it debut on television in November yeah. I think it was November 95 20th maybe in my head um, and so by September 95 the, it's almost put to bed by this point it, it's right on deadline and, and they're kind of it's just finishing off and I wasn't, uh, there had been a day, the previous day, Paul and George and Ringo had all been in the anthology edit suite, which was in London West 12 in a little rented place in Wendell Road. And um, they'd been going through, I think, the final episode, which obviously covered the more difficult Mm. part in the breakup. And um, it dredged everything up for them because Paul was now seeing what George said about it and George was now seeing what Paul said about it and they're both seeing what Ringo said about it and so on. <clears throat> and that was the day before the Buddy Holly Week party. And at the Buddy Holly Week party, all the anthology production team were there and I was sitting with them because I, I, we were working together all the time. So I was at the party through Paul's office. and But we sat together and because I was sitting with the anthology team... Paul came over and talked to them. He wasn't talking to me, but I'm just sitting there and he's reflecting on how it had been the day before watching the rough cut with George and Ringo and obviously it had been really tough. And he was emoting to them about, wow, what a really tough day that was yesterday and bloody hell, God, you know, there were bits that I didn't think would get through it and all the stuff that had obviously come up in conversation that had been private to that room and I wasn't present but I was there when he was reflecting on it the next day with the team. And, um, God, that was a great moment for me, just, mm. just to wit- witness Paul saying all that to them. Yes. I just happened to be there when he said it. But as I get older, I realise they're, they're human beings. Like mm. it's, uh, you know, when, when I was younger, I was like, oh, why do they, why can't they just get on? But you mm. just realise when you get older, yeah. people fall apart, and it's hard to get over yes. stuff, even with the best will in the world, you know? I think that it seems to me... I mean, we we were all aware through the 70s and the 80s and probably into the early 90s when they were disagreeing with one another. You would get Paul disagreeing with Yoko quite openly Mm -hmm. and her disagreeing with Paul quite openly. Um, And George and Paul obviously had some issues that that did come out because we know about them. Mm. But it also seems to me that probably from the late 90s, maybe for about the last 20 years, they must have actually had a they've got a policy now that they keep it all private. Yes. Because we don't yes. know any you of that stuff know. anymore. We don't know what Paul thinks of Yoko now or vice versa. Yeah. They've obviously made an agreement to keep it quiet. And I think from their point of view, that's quite sensible. Mm. And this is this is Apple really actively curating the, 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 the legacy. Mm. Um, and I suppose one of the, the, the things for me is, is, is it simply curating the legacy or is it rewriting history a little bit? And I suppose that's maybe what we're, we're hoping volumes two and three are going to uh, mm. 
uh, to, to, to give us that insight. But after anthology, then at what point does it start to tip into, in your mind, it's a biography. I, I can take, I can build on the research that, that well, you... There is the, I, I don't want to, I, I, I know you've spoken a, a lot in the past about how George was the main impetus for you to be pushed away from the Beatles organisation. Is that, that's a fair yeah, thing to say? Yeah, George and then Olivia, yeah. Um, so, but you're still working with Paul because you, you're, you're involved in Flaming Pie and... Well, I was working for Paul, I was editing Club Sandwich for Paul. Yes. From 91 to 98. Yes. And, and Flaming Pie fell in that period. Mm. And he basically used the anthology team going forward. I mean, it was still Jeff Wan for... There was a, a an interview with Paul done for the World Tonight documentary that's me and Jeff Baker interviewing Paul. Yeah. Uh, you just see the backs of our shoulders. You don't see our faces, <laughs> but that's us. And, um, uh, and he had Rick Ward of the team do the artwork for it. It's so like a continuation of the yeah. anthology, really. And because I'd done the liner notes on the anthology CDs, so I did them for Flaming Fire That's what as I well. was thinking of, yeah, that yeah. you're still writing for Paul and you're still in his sleeve notes. Yes, I was. And I'm um, going to, went to a session or two and yeah. a video shoot or two as well. But then after that, you, you, you write your kind of non-Beatles books. You have your comedy books, your Guide to Comedy and your Benny Hill biography. And yeah. I'm wondering, were they purposely for you as a sort of an... Uh, did you do that intentionally to kind of do a non-Beatles thing to clear your head or to... To, to, to get another skill set or how did you uh... um, there were always other things I wanted to write about mm. and I'd just become this Beatles guy and of course <laughs> that's not a problem but I wanted to do other things as well and uh, I was writing for Radio Times magazine and pitched to them this idea of a TV comedy encyclopedia which was ludicrously ambitious mm. and not thought through properly <laughs> but it ended up being a good book yeah. and indeed came out twice so uh, and that led me into doing the biography of Benny Hill Mm. when the recording sessions book came out I went to New York in 1988 and I sat in the office of a man at Crown Publishing who said to me uh, now you should write the Beatles biography Right. and I was 30 years old and all my books were reference books factual books and as far as I was concerned biography was written by the likes of Hunter Davis or Philip Norman mm. or whoever mm. you know any biographer but not me because I wrote reference books and I, and he said, you, well, you could do it. And I said, no, I can't. And I think you need to know where you're strong mm -hmm. and also where you're not strong in life generally. And um, certainly in terms of anything you do professionally. So I said no, mm -hmm. carried on doing reference books. But by the turn of the century, 12 years later or so, I was in my 40s and had a different, more circumspect view of life and what I could do and what I couldn't do. Mm -hmm. And um, when it was suggested to me that I write a biography of somebody, and being that I'd done this comedy encyclopedia, it should be a comedian, I ended up doing Benny Hill. It wasn't actually my choice to do Benny Hill, but I went along with it. Mm. And uh, I really did it to see if I could write biography. Yeah. Well, you know, it's been told, I've been mentioned as a biographer, but can I actually do it? Yeah. So I found that I could. And as soon as I knew that I could and I enjoyed the the task of researching it and then writing your own research into a flowing narrative where you connect everything together then i knew i had to go back to the beatles okay so that's when you say yes around 2002 2003 yeah. to, to to doing that yeah that's when the current project yeah took 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 root <laughs> yes that's a long run yeah and i mean i've i've just lived with somebody for 5 years who's done a phd and i have a vague idea of you know how you collate the information before you even sit down to write and I, mm. you, you are a phenomenally patient person when people on Twitter are like when's the book when's the book mm. and I, I don't I, you know the writing's important but it's all the other all the other stuff is the stuff you have to get right first isn't it nobody knows what goes into the writing of a book especially people <laughs> who don't write books <laughs> okay. I mean they have they can't have any yeah. idea it's as simple as that just like you can't understand anybody else's job and um, writing books are certainly the way I write them and the way I write them is the only way I can write them and want to write them is a long, long process. Mm. Yeah. And the first volume took 10 years. Yeah. But people didn't know that because it just kind of appeared. Yes. Um, but And then they want the second one like a year later or two years later. It's not possible. Yeah. But you must realize, I, I kind of realized after reading Tune In, you go back to a book like The Sessions and 
you know, that's not a list book. There is a narrative there. There is a story there. You know, the, 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 there's great writing in that book as well. You know, it's if you say so, <laughs> I, I wouldn't say so. OK, myself. OK. Mm. Well, I have a mm. huge personal attachment to the Sessions mm. book. As well. I know. I know people do. <laughs> um, so so at which point you, you feel to to write the tune in books, you're, you're obviously totally separate from Apple at the minute. None of this is sanctioned. None of this is official. Um, and so what does that give you as a researcher and an author then that uh, you couldn't do before? Um, well, the number one thing it gives me is independence. Mm. Um, there is a what I used to call APC, Apple Politically Correct. <laughs> uh, you have to write in a particular way. I learned it on the anthology project where my note, my liner notes would be read by Derek and then by Neil. And it would be like, you can't say this, you can't say that. And it wouldn't be that I was writing anything inflammatory, but just you have to be aware of, of equality straight down the line, all four Beatles getting their equal space in the sunshine. Mm-hmm. Um, so um, not that I'm deviating from that now. I'm still trying to be fair and balanced, but um, it's easier to write about artists if they're not controlling your hand Yes, in any, any artists of any kind. And you, you mentioned last night that uh, Hornsey Road is you know, like a preview of Volume 3, was what you said to us. Uh, yeah, uh, a little bit of it, yeah. Mm. And I'm wondering, you know, the Volume 1 goes up to the end of 62 and the release of Love Me Do. Mm. And it must be that the way you look for information changes because in the first time you're kind of panning for gold trying to find the Beatles. And then once you get past 63, they become the news. Mm. And how do you... How do you start to even filter or process all of that? Because it becomes a tsunami, doesn't With it? Gr- it? Absolutely, yeah. Great difficulty on that one. <laughs> Great difficulty. I mean, I, I'm out there trying to, as ever, research everything. Yeah. And... Um, with the next two volumes, I'm absolutely overwhelmed with everything that I've got to wade through to make sense of, to make a, a clear narrative from. And again, fans kind of think, oh, well, there's a certain date and time between volumes two and three, but you're obviously researching it all yeah. uh, in one swoop. Yeah. And it, it, it just Yeah, you're just constantly together. out there looking for anything that you can find. And of course, there's a lot of it, and I get offered a lot by people, by complete strangers writing <laughs> to me, which is always wonderful, but my email inbox is is ridiculous at the moment and hundreds of emails unanswered it's hard just to keep on top of the managing of a project like this yes let alone the writing of it yeah. and again those who carp on about why it's not coming out they just don't know yeah 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 do you think that has fallen away i mean you, you uh, the carping that people are starting to appreciate no no <laughs> it's still going <laughs> we're still putting no, you under pressure but right? it is flattering i mean mm. it's, if, if it uh, you know it's it's nice to be talked about and um it would be it would be awful if i was spending all these years writing books that seemingly no one was waiting for um mm. so that is very reassuring but um <laughs> Mm, but sometimes the negative comments get. I can, down s- a I bit, can see your shoulders drop at that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they do a little bit. But I mean, maybe it, I shouldn't just shouldn't look. But uh, um, yeah, mm. it, it, but it, it's this idea that that in the first volume you're sort of travelling to the north of Scotland and looking at local newspapers and uh, as Jason said, you're sort of panning for gold and little bits and pieces, and that's fine. But then, literally every local newspaper in the world mm. will have a Beatles story in 1964 or yeah. 1965. You know, yes. the middle of nowheresville arizona will have something Mm -hmm. um and it it's it's almost as if you you've set the bar so high Mm -hmm. with volume one not just for other biographers and i'm not flattering you by saying i don't think any biography i've read since tune in comes close to that level of research and, and and um but you're also setting the bar high for yourself yeah with the sheer volume i mean i i i'm trying to get my head around I'm thinking you could probably write another six or seven volumes mm-hmm. just 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 <laughs> taking each year or each six month period at <laughs> yes, a time yes I could yeah. I could um, I could easily do that yeah mm, there's, there's you heard it here first there's going to be, <laughs> yeah. uh, there's, going to be <laughs> there's plenty enough material um, but yes I, I did set the bar high and uh, to keep it there mm, mm, I know I've really yeah. the hard volume one was really hard book to write mm-hmm. but I just got my head down and did yeah. it but um but it's the, the next two will be harder yeah but it's the point of being a historian i think maybe you know you think of books like robert a caro's series of books on johnson which i know you've been compared to before but we're looking at a historical piece it's not a rock bio in the traditional sense it's no. it's there for history this is this is the one for the ages yes. and that's your that's your aim it's, isn't it it's the ultimate in flattery for the beatles if only they knew it <laughs> <No>. <laughs> well we were talking about this before and i know i've heard you say uh 
you know, that they, they met the right person with George Martin as a producer and Brian Epstein as a mm. manager. But mm. with you, they've met the right biographer. Maybe, as you say, they don't know it. Mm. But in, at, at the long run, you know, you're cometh the hour. <laughs> you know, this is That's the, very nice these. of you to say. <laughs> I mean, I, uh, thank you. Oh, well, That's <laughs> all I can say to that. Thank you. I, I mean, I'm... I know I'm good at what I do, hmm. and I think you do. You do need to know where you're strong, as, and you need to know where you're not strong. As yeah. I said earlier, and uh, I know that I'm good at this job. Yeah, and it happens to require a set of skills that I happen to have, okay. and that's just the way it is. Uh, and it would be nice if they um, were a bit more open-minded about that. I think they are fortunate to have anyone write their biography in this way, whether it was me or somebody else. Yeah, um, but it's it's different now. Because people have agendas, and I'm someone's agenda. Mm. But I think mm. it, I think it's a biography that's worthy of the subject, and and the, it, the subject Absolutely. is worthy of this biography. I mean, I think uh, as Jason says, it's not. It, I I don't really think of it as being a rock biography. It is. It's a. It, you're a historian rather than mm. a biographer. I think that's yes. really the difference between what you're doing and what every other biographer whether it's of the Beatles or the Stones or yes. any other band I mean it's uh, every other book seems to be just a quick trot yes. through a chronology when you compare it with they so deserve this they, they <laughs> yeah. really yeah. really do deserve they absolutely merit a book like this mm. like, which is going to be like 5,000 pages by the time it's done yeah and um, I've said this before but I'll, I'll say it again <clears throat> to me the Beatles represent truth um with a capital T, I think that they were incredibly true to themselves at the time when they were going through all of this. I know John said things like in the Wenner interview about, you know, the things they had to compromise and put themselves through. But you look at any Beatles interview, you look at any bit of newsreel film, he's obviously remembering certain sharp incidents, mm. moments that he's then enlarging as being representative of a whole period. But you look at the Beatles as they go through the 1960s, and I don't just mean by albums, I mean every little bit of newsreel film, every photograph, every interview they ever gave at any time, they were always being completely true to who they were and doing it their way. And um, that, for me, is why one of the reasons why they sustain and will continue to sustain because something that true and that organic and that honest is going to always rise above anything else. And um, I'm trying to write the book that is that matches that truth in every sense as the ultimate of compliments to them. Because if you really want to know the Beatles, you need to know them on every level and get the truth on every level. And I, by that, I don't mean anything as crass as I'm going to be exposing this or that. I mean the truth of the moments that they went through and the whole of the story that they had, that all of those years, much of which was not just within their control, but was people reflecting on them, how they altered other people's lives and so on. But to set that down and to get it as right as possible is something that they deserve and anyone who reads, ultimately, when the trilogy is finished, anyone who reads it will understand the Beatles in a way that they couldn't get that understanding in any other form. So it's, it's the ultimate compliment to mm. them. And uh, it grieves me that, um, that uh, this is not recognized by them, but I can't control other people's thinking. No. no All no. I can do is be straight. Mm. So. I mean, do you think, do you think, I mean, I, I, I would be surprised if at some point, I mean, we, we, we sort of got to face the fact that there will come a, there will come a day when Paul isn't with us and Ringo isn't with us, and, mm. but the organisation will it sustain, will it will evolve something. and prevail and yeah. it will think, but it would be nice to think that perhaps at that point, this becomes recognised by the organisation, that, that the people who are, the individuals you're writing about can't see it, but there needs to be maybe a little bit. I don't know that it's them. I don't know because Apple is Apple is a lot of people. Mm. Apple is a number of people who sit on the board, but it's mm. also ultimately four owners still. And uh, I don't know who it is. I, actually, I do know who it is, but I'm not saying who <laughs> it is um, that will be ensuring that I'm kept at arm's length. Mm. Um, and hopefully, that will change in time. Has you were saying about the importance of independence, but. Have you ever had a sense that they that people have been told don't don't speak to yes. Mark Lewis and that yes. that's yes. I'm I'm my biggest beef and I might as well say it, my biggest beef with Apple these days is the cowardice of of how they've operated with me. 
because I had a very strong relationship with Neil Aspinall and with Derek and was part of 19 mm. projects that um, made them a lot of money not just thanks to me of course but they wanted my input and valued my expertise enough to hire me and pay me and thank me for my services um, but about three years ago I was pursuing um, actually it happened three times I was three different archival inquiries that I was actually pursuing and in each case inexplicably when I thought I'd jumped every last hoop that needed to be jumped in order to gain access it would suddenly be shut off to me and with no explanation and on one of those occasions somebody and I obviously I won't say who said to me I shouldn't be telling you this but we've been told not to cooperate with you and we can't let you see anything and I went who told you that um, and it was Apple. Apple and I just thought you bastards you know, I'm trying to write your book here, yeah. and I'm trying to get it as right as possible going by going to paperwork that no one's ever looked at, and that's going to enhance this the telling of this story even better. And you're not letting me see it, and you don't even know what it is you're not letting me see. You don't even know, you don't know anything mm. about what's in that archive. But I just I'd like to see it so I can write your story better. And um, and so I wrote a challenging email. And I said, I understand you're blocking me now. And I got a one-line dismissal back from that, from my email. And I just thought, mm. hmm. right, now I know who I'm dealing with here. But it's so unnecessary. It's so ridiculous. Mm. I'm trying to write their story, and they're stopping me. Yeah. And I'm someone that they can trust and did trust. Mm. And I'm not some just, you know, bloke they don't know. Well, I was going to say, they, they, they had that relationship. And is it just that those, the people with whom you had that relationship that closeness with Neil and Derek aren't there anymore and it's 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 just the organization has changed it doesn't help because when George took against me which was just ludicrous because you know he charged me with offenses I'd never done mm. um, I had people like Derek and Neil to go in and defend me didn't make any difference because even Derek and Neil couldn't change his mind mm. on things um, but nonetheless I did have advocates and I don't have advocates there now yeah. Um so, and of course, they're not obliged to be nice to me or use me. But I think it's. I think they've behaved. I think they've behaved badly. Mm. There, there are a few people that, like Derek Taylor and Neil Aspinall, that are no longer with us, and that that obviously would be key potential interviewees. Mm. Um, Alex Magic Alex is yeah. one uh, are, are, of those people that are Mal Evans, etc. Are there people that you have? were able to interview before they passed away you know Neil for example or Derek Neil but not enough mm. Derek yes uh, but not for this project but I did interview him a few times um, Magic Alex well I mean, <laughs> um, <laughs> there's a, quite a long story attached to that but um, the brief bit is that uh, I got in touch with his solicitor his lawyer quite a few years ago and said look Alex is always portrayed as, you know, he, he was a fool and a rip-off artist and, you know, a scam merchant. And a charlatan. A, a we, can't, char we can't use that word. <laughs> a, char a charlatan. Okay, you're ahead of me in this, in this tale. But um, if he wants to put his point of view, I'll listen. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm not necessarily going to swallow it all, but I'll listen and I'll give him a fair hearing. And I'm sure there's a second side to the story. And quite apart from anything else, he was around them for a very long time yeah. and witnessed to loads of events. So I'll have all those stories from him as well. <clears throat> and um, I do know somebody, a guy called Peter Doggett, a writer, who, mm -hmm. yeah. who did go out and see Alex, not for a, an interview, but just when Alex was selling a load of stuff through Christie's. Um, Christie's took Peter out to meet him to be there and have a look at all this stuff and to write the catalogue, mm. basically. And he, Peter, told me in the moment that Alex knows a lot of stuff that is really interesting because he was around them so much. And so he, he's told what quite one dimensionally and people attack him who never met him. And uh, I'm not saying he's innocent of any of those things, but, I, you know, the, he will have a side to his story mm -hmm. and he hadn't ever told it. So I wrote to the solicitor, said if he ever wants to have a fair hearing, if he wants to put his side of the story with someone who isn't going to judge him, but will listen honestly, then I'm the man and I'll come out to Greece and I'll interview him. 
and um, then I entered the Alex world, which was a bit <laughs> a bit mad. And yes, it's going to happen, and no, it's not going to happen, and yes, it's going to happen, and no, it's not going to happen. And after a couple of years of that, you think, <laughs> you know, and I would just write another letter to the solicitor going, I'm still here, and I'm, my offer is still on the table, but time is moving on. And then he got ill and died, mm-hmm. so it never happened. And you don't know if he ever uh, wrote something down or committed anything to paper? I don't know that he did, but that would be unchallenged then. Whereas mm. if I had interviewed him, I yes, would have, could, I would have been could. asking him to qualify things and trying to rationalise what he was saying. And one, so on. one of the interesting things that popped up on screen uh, last night at the Hornsey Road was a diary of Mal Evans' mm. uh, diary. Mm. Um, th- there are a lot of stories that Mal Evans was on the point of publishing his autobiography he'd written that manuscript and then I've never read anywhere where that is still sitting somewhere because it seems to me that that there are interviews with Mal Evans if there was a basic manuscript there's something there the 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 raw material is there for a biography or a semi autobiographical work is that manuscript or is that diary something that you 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 have access to or I've had some access to Mal's diaries, but not as much as I would like. Mm. Um, but, but I'm working on that. Okay. Um, I mean, there's a lot of um, when you do a book like this, um, there's a, you, there's a, so many different approaches, there's so many different people, and everyone has to be handled sympathetically. Mm. And a lot of time is spent taken on things like that that aren't sitting me. me yes, sitting actually writing. doing that. Yeah. yeah. Um, but the um, the manuscript exists, and I've read that. Oh. Okay. And uh, it's as a manuscript now, it wouldn't be good enough. No. But as the basis of something, it might. It but that's might that's work. that's what I was thinking as as the, the sort of the, the core, to, you know, to build something around. Because yes. uh, he was he was present. I know the family have had quite a few approaches from people who want to continue. They want to do something creative mm. in Mal's name. But yeah. um, I think Mal's wife Lily is still around, and she obviously isn't wanting those things okay. to happen. Okay. And I suppose the other for me, the other two, we can't not mention Jane Asher. She's mm-hmm. I- indicating she's she's not going to give interviews. She's never. The situation remains unchanged as far yeah. as I know. Um, what is she, Jane, Jane now? 73. So she still has time. It's quite remarkable, the silence. It's quite admirable. Quite dignified. Oh, I think it's great. Yeah. <laughs> I really do. I, <laughs> yeah. mean, the I mean, frustrating, but dignified. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Oh, yeah, I think she's very dignified. Mm. And what about uh, the Yoko, who's, I suppose, the other the woman in that circle is she on your interview list or uh, no I, I have interviewed Yoko a couple of times um, but not for this project um, but as you've heard me say many times <laughs> uh, in other interviews I, I'll take anything that mm. anybody said to anybody at any time yeah. if, if it's good and usable and trustworthy and uh, so I have all the interviews she's, she's ever done they just haven't been with me yeah. And um, I think now, at, what is she now, 86, mm. uh, one probably wouldn't get the kind of um, detailed responses that I would be looking for. And I suppose if the interviews are there and, and you can exercise that sort of challenge function mm. uh, to, ag- against the other information you have, that's yes. almost better than having somebody at, at that remove trying to recall yes. uh, detail. Yes, I mean... The interviews that they've all given, everyone has been interviewed extensively. Mm. And although a lot of the interviews are bland, they're not all bland. Mm. And although a lot of the questions are, are tedious, they're not all tedious. And quite often, if, if I mean, this is true, if you read 1970s interviews with Paul, the, Im- the impression we always have is that he didn't say anything of substance, but he did. He did. Yes. Yeah. He did. Yeah. He certainly did. And it might be related to, it might be even something that the interviewer isn't asking him, but it's something that, a coal that got raked over that morning before, <laughs> before he came in to do the interview and he wants to say something. Mm. And there are quite a lot of that. Paul interviews are interesting how they evolve over time. His 70s interviews are different to his 80s interviews, and now right. he has these National Treasure interviews, you know? Yes. But I remember, like, in the 80s, he'd be going on talk shows, particularly I remember him being on Noel Edmonds and being hugely mm. surly, and he yes. wouldn't be doing any of that now. But the, he, he's hiding in plain sight a lot of stuff. People kind of say, oh, we can't, we don't know what he means. You, you know exactly what he means. Yes. He kind of means what he means. Okay. And, and, yeah, exactly. Exa- what you've just said, I was having this discussion earlier with Stephen, um, 
their their insights into the man hmm. even it, when how he chooses not to say something is actually interesting to see yes if you know what i mean yep. because it gives you an insight into his psyche hmm. and um we were talking about one of my pet subjects which is the give my regards to broad street film oh well, that's also <laughs> one of jason's pet subjects let's, right let's, I, I can <laughs> step i can step out of the room at this point but <laughs> jason will do that, that. yes <laughs> because quite apart from the content of the film which is you know you can view that however you do yeah um is the fact that he thought of it he wrote it and he cast he character the characters in it come out of his head yeah so that's a real insight into the way he thinks even though he's just writing a fictional script yeah his thought processes are visible and that is interesting hmm and they're quite apart from the content of the film yeah it's a, it's a it's an interesting time because broad street it's it's kind of disappeared mm. and i don't know should it have disappeared i think it should be more we should be able to see it shouldn't we yes in the light of all of paul's back catalogue eventually resurfacing and being reevaluated, broad street may yet have its moment but there is the grand theory that broad street is the the barrier between or the, or the border between you know post beatles paul and then you know the kind of the, the paul we have today which is retrospective and touring and, and all the rest yeah, that really happened. The the pool that we see today, that, that evolved from 87, 88, 89. The Flowers in the Dirt album is the is the is the launch of yeah. Paul with his Hofner violin bass. Yes. Going out on tour doing Beatles hits. Yeah. Yeah. And he's been doing that for thirty years now. Yeah. Since eighty nine. Thirty years of basically a Beatles touring show. But he's still doing it's interesting to see how all legacy acts are approaching this, like mm. from say Fleetwood Mike saying no music no new music just touring mm. Paul still wants to of be course. doing new projects all the time yeah and Egypt Station being a number one was something that he very much wanted yes and which he got in the States anyway mm. um, okay did we have a few sort of f- uh, we wondered, outlier questions yes if we wondered if we could maybe ask you some random yeah. questions um, these are things that have picked our brains for a long time so uh, uh, one of the uh, w- we had talked about this earlier about uh, last night in in Hornsey Road y- you were talking about the the 3 to 1 Alan Klein split and I was saying to you that it seemed to me that that paralleled what is mentioned in tune in about uh, the appointment of Brian Epstein that that Paul was sort of holding back or was not uh, keen uh, to move forward with Brian Epstein and I suppose my question was is there a direct parallel there? And would, in 1969, John and George in particular have been conscious of that parallel? Yes. I'm sure the answer to that is yes, because John mentioned it in interviews, probably in When Ernst, maybe the one with um, McCabe and Schoenfeld. Schoenfeld. Um, yes, John recognised that, 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 you know, this is a continuation this is a repeat yeah. of what you've done before and in the clip of Paul speaking to me which I play in the Hornsey Road show mm. where John says you're always <clears throat> stalling yeah. um, that is J- Paul remembering that John did say that and John did say that, say that because he was re- remembering back to 1961 which is only what seven, yes. seven and a bit years yeah. earlier yeah. Yeah. and um, also Paul with Brian had said of course Brian initially I think it was um was it 20% or 15% or whatever it was that Brian was after in the, in the initial contract? Um, Paul was saying, well, you know, let's let's offer him less. <laughs> yes. Not not because he's worth less uh, or we're worth more, but because that's what you do in a negotiation. Yes. Don't you? Yeah. You, you offer less. And um, and again, he tried to do that with Alan Klein and, the, uh, and Paul and John was going on, you know, not again, basically. So, mm. yes, um, John did make reference to the fact that he saw the parallel there. Um, but John was someone who would, you know, as Paul says, would jump over the cliff. Yes. Uh, and Paul would say, you jump and tell me what it's tell like. Tell me what it's like. Yeah. And you can see both points of view there. And that is, you know, John jumped in with Klein. Literally, they meet in the Dorchester Hotel on the 27th of January, is it? <laughs> 1969. Mm. And that night in the hotel suite, his letters of authorization are typed and he signs them. Jeez. Yes. Nothing good happens in the Dorchester, we've learned today. Oh, well, right, well, yes. 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 Yeah, <laughs> ironic then that the meeting was held there again <laughs> yeah. in 1983. But, but Paul still has a... Uh, he still sort of, as I understand it, I know Scott Rogers is the guy who looks after him these days, but mm. he, I think Paul doesn't call him a manager. He still likes to feel unmanaged, isn't that right? He's still There's still a thread of that where he's... Yeah, the Paul McCartney period that, 
is is what we still have today that began in 89 mm. say that he was managed then by a man called Richard Ogden who I the only one of Paul's managers I knew that was current actually it was in his office a lot yeah and um, so I was observing how he managed Paul and that was a good relationship for a while but not forever mm. and then when he left um, I don't think Paul has actually had a hands-on manager yes. since then I think he felt that Paul has always managed his managers. Paul appoints his managers. Hmm. And um, now he has an arrangement. I don't know Scott Roger, but it seems to be an arrangement where Scott Roger runs a management company and has several artists. Yes. And Paul buys his time, as it were, for whatever he needs from him. Fair enough. Management services, but he's not got his feet yeah. under the desk at MPL. He's somewhere else. Yeah. Mm. Okay. Uh, one of the things that always intrigued me is the relationship, the continuing relationship uh, uh, with Mona Best mm. after Pete leaves the group. And, and it's that Lennon sending to Mona Best for the medals to wear on the cover of... Uh, I mean, was that... An, I, I know that there's the Neil Aspinall relationship uh, with, with Mona Best, but was did she remain on reasonably good terms even after Pete left, even after the sort of lawsuits and uh, you know that Lennon felt able to to send someone up to collect those medals or is that more an indication of Lennon's personality than the relationship well it all depends on who you listen to <laughs> <laughs> that one because Mona never said this and she died when did she die 88 or 91 I can't remember when she died in that period um, she never claimed this I don't think Pete claims it. I may be wrong, but I don't think Pete claims it. I think it's just a family claim. And I think it was in that book that Pete and Rory and Roe Best did together in the beginnings, was it called, mm. about 20 years ago. Um, that made kind of emphasis on the fact that Mona Best's medals were uh, on the Sgt. Pepper cover and mm -hmm. that John had asked for yes. them or something. Um and that is therefore has fed your knowledge That's so, so yeah. that you're quoting it at me but um, all I can tell you is that I had discussed it with Neil and he said it and he said it was complete crap <laughs> right that's my Neil impression uh, complete crap Neil seems to have been brilliant yes like absolutely yeah extraordinary yeah, I believe so yeah yeah, yeah. I mean amazing gatekeeper yes the best him. the very and, best and again that point about the the, the politics, the personal politics, he seems to be the one that could navigate that, that could keep all of that. He could. Um, you know, he was he was still acting and had a relationship with each of the four of them. Yeah, he, he was the Beatles' longest serving manager. And I know that people think, what do you mean? I mean, they're Brian Epstein, Alan Williams, Brian Epstein, and maybe Alan Klein, if you count that. Um, but it wasn't really, he was more business manager. But... Um, but actually, Neil Aspinall managed them from about 73, 74 mm. to 2007. Yeah. And um, that's a very long time. And, and that was the hardest management job of all because they still have collective projects. Mm. Um, but th they've got four different points of view quite often. And he's trying to somehow balance all of that. And mm -hmm. I think he did a brilliant job. But back to the Mona Best thing. Um, when, Pete, when Neil said it was complete crap, uh, he was actually speaking of the claims by his family members. So he he was outing his family members as, as <laughs> manufacturers of stories to me. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'll go with what he said okay. personally. Neil's, uh, Neil's good enough for me. Neil was still living with the best as late as 67. Oh, right. Really? And he told me he just picked up the medals and took them down to London. And okay. that's it. It's nothing to do with Mona. And I don't believe that Mona had any association with them. But I wasn't there, and I may be wrong. Okay. okay. But okay. I, that's my impression. Okay. One of my uh, one of my own theories is that a key point is the she said, she said session, mm -hmm. where Paul, there's a row of some description, and mm -hmm. Paul leaves, and George at this point is sort of helping uh, John to finish that, that track. Mm. And I can't remember where I read it, but that George had an expectation at that point that he would get a writing credit or that this might be the start of, you mm. know, that he and John might write, that this was really a sort of a Harrison-Lennon collaboration. And then when... A follow-up to Cry for a Shadow. Yes, and when, <laughs> that, and when that didn't happen, that that was a sort of, uh, sort of bit of scales falling from his eyes. And this sort of coincided with 
the the American tour and Candlestick Park and the Indian music and him putting down the guitar and but that that's if right at the beginning they had said all of the songs will be Lennon McCartney Harrison that that would have been fundamentally different mm-hmm. uh, in in the band and that a lot of it comes back to those sort of ri- to the writing credit issue yes. I agree with you. I don't have anything to add to that, except except <laughs> okay. I want to know. Where, I want to know where George said that. I will. I'm trying to think where I read that. It might have been in the Steve Turner 1966 book. Mm, I wonder what his source was. I will see if I can find that. Mm. I can see if I can. Find I'd like it. to know that okay. one. <clears throat> uh, can I ask you a question on behalf of my niece? <laughs> she yes. asked me this question a few years ago, and I couldn't. She she was seven at the time, and she said. Is the yellow submarine on which the Beatles live the same yellow submarine as in Thunderbirds? No. She'd be so oh, disappointed. No. no, I've looked into that um, um, to see which came first and the Beatles came first. Oh, oh, right. right. Because yeah. I, I was telling her, well, possibly because I thought yellow submarine, the writing of that came slightly after the first appearance of, of Thunderbird 4, but maybe, maybe... No, but she was. She was. I, I remember looking into it and finding that there was no correlation. But um, but then I was thinking, did, Paul, did, did Paul have a color television in 1966? <laughs> no. I, I well, Britain know. had no color television yeah. until oh, yeah. 1967. Peace so that, that's so he wouldn't have known it was a yellow submarine. No, anyway, <laughs> no, not necessarily. But I have found um, a book that Paul may well have seen that has a yellow submarine on the front cover. Oh. Oh, okay, it did does predate the song. Hmm. So there possibly he saw that book cover. Okay. I'll, I'll let her know. Yeah. I'll let her know. <laughs> let her down yes. gently. Yes. Yeah. As far as I know, I'm, I have looked into that, and in my mind, I, it was, it was, um, I concluded that it wasn't possible. I just remember being but so, have to so see my notes to taken aback that the seven-year-old had made the connection and yeah. was asking me a question I couldn't. It's brilliant. Uh, I, I, I couldn't, I couldn't answer. And what a great song, "Yellow Submarine" is. Yes. Yes. A, a, so brave to, yeah. to, to do that and to put it out as a single as well, and um, the immediacy of that record. That so that, I mean, it came out on August the fifth. And the English football season, as it usually does, it begins around August the 12th, that kind of second weekend in August. And at the first Chelsea home match, all the fans at the shed were singing, we all live in a blue submarine. <laughs> and it had been out one week. Wow. And that is, that's the Beatles. I mean, they're just direct mainlining into the culture. Yeah. Is that a single that you remember as a, uh, as a child? That, that no, specifically? No, actually I don't. Hmm. I don't, no. Oh, yeah. And the other question... But the song was around it. Yes, 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 yeah. yes, yeah. yes. There's an episode of Till Death Us Depart shot that Christmas or shown that Christmas um, called Till Closing Time Do Us Part and it's set in a pub mm-hmm. and they're all having a sing-along a Cockney pub and they're singing Yellow Submarine. And it's, God, you know, Paul McCartney. How fast. But that is an amazing Paul thing. McCartney, how incredible is that? Yeah. About the Lennon-McCartney songbook is how... I know they talk about another Lennon and McCartney original, you know, early on in their career, mm. but how it does get co-opted into light entertainment and all forms of showbiz in a way that none of their contemporaries yes. were doing. Yes, you know, on BBC Saturday evening shows. Yes, it's it's really striking when, you know, BBC Four pull out all these you know old clips and th- these songs were just they would just tip them into yes. the culture and everybody would go fly with them. Nineteen sixty five, I think it was. There was a light end show called the Roy Castle show oh Roy, Roy Castle. I remember nice, record breakers nice yeah. enter- yes record breakers <laughs> well there was a feature one week a, a Beatle ballet with a ballerina from Covent Garden dancing <laughs> a Beatle ballet to specially recorded music for the for that um, well it came out on, on, a, on an EP actually in a n- nice picture sleeve with her dancing on the cover and that bit of ballet music I think it's all my loving I might be getting this wrong, but a bit of that music anyway ended up in Magical Mystery Tour. Oh, okay. Mm, the Beatle Cracker Suite, it was called. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. And uh, and you just think, yeah, incredible. I mean, there's the, it's being danced as a ballet. Yeah. And these days, we're quite used to crossover, but in those days, they kind of almost originated yeah. crossover. It is that, is that, it, it's that cross-generational appeal, Yeah. which I think almost from 63 all the way up, probably until Sgt. Pepper was the tipping point where we're suddenly the grandparents and the parents were thinking mm. this is a little bit strange yeah. Yeah. Um, but one of the things I, I remember discussing I think maybe with Piers Hemmingson was mm. this idea that in America the, 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 the generation gap opened up incredibly quickly 
in that sort of from 64 to 67 and obviously there was Vietnam and there was the draft and there were a lot of other factors that weren't applicable but that in in Britain uh, I was saying possibly it didn't open quite as quickly as it could have done because the Beatles oh. had that cross-generational appeal yeah. you know there was all, even on Sgt Pepper there's when I'm 64 there's something for the there's the granny music and there's <laughs> something for the old people there's something for the kids and it's really magical mystery tour I suppose when they start to get very dark mm -hmm. and very strange but even there Fool on the Hill and Your Mother Should Know are yeah. two yeah. songs of great there's still that to nod to, to, to um, but mm -hmm. you can but that's the point at which and the other very interesting thing from Hornsey Road last night was we were saying about how there was a sort of a backlash or there was a how low the Beatles standing was you know the Daily Mail were saying mm. what happened various what's going wrong and yeah, various that's... newspapers and you just gave us that one as, uh, yeah. as the example I hadn't really appreciated that was something new to me last night yes. was sort of appreciating just how that how they stood you, you know we, we we look back now and we th I remember my father when I bring I brought home a copy of sometime in New York City and he was absolutely scathing and about mm. John and Yoko and bed ins <laughs> and and I thought, well, that that didn't seem odd to me that you would do that, have a bed in, or you would. But clearly, that was a huge people, issue. It was a the bed in was about peace, and the general reaction to it was a violent one. Mm. Yes, yeah. and John noticed that. Yeah, and um, he, to his enormous credit, just carried on. Yeah, didn't let it derail him. Mm -hmm. Well, let's ask about the ballad of John and Yoko. Because oh, and this is another thing. Obviously, me and Stephen have fantastically interesting conversations. Mm. But you talked last night about John and Yoko being one word, indivisible, altogether in 1969. Was Yoko at the Ballad of John and Yoko session? Do we know? There's no knowledge of that. Yeah. I mean, what do we have? There are no photographs of that session. Yeah. And um, uh, she's not audible on the tape. Yeah. But um, I mean, I, I just sat and listened to all of the January 1969 tapes. And apart from some times when they jammed together, the Yoko's there the whole time and you hardly hear her. She, yes. was, she was perfectly capable of just sitting there quietly. She would knit or read <laughs> or do something. Yeah. Um, so she may have been there. All we have is the is the session tape. Yes. And she's not audible on the tape, but she may have been in the control room. I, I, I love the ballad of John and Yoko because I think it, it, it changes the 1969 story quite specifically, that one day, that one song, mm. because you can kind of see a way of how they could have worked going forward. You know, just, yes. let's just... Let's just do the show right here kind of thing. And when you consider all their differences yes. by April 69, their ability to still come together and record like that. And all, incidentally, there's a follow up to that. I, in the first draft of Hornsey Road, which ran about five hours, I, <laughs> I covered all That's the of Hamburg this. version where yeah. you perform yeah. it for five hours a night. <laughs> um, yeah, I know. Yeah, with prellies. Um, I had a feature on You Know My Name, Look Up the Number, oh, which is yeah. two weeks after Ballad of John and Yoko. Mm. And again, it's just John and Paul, the, yes. Nurk, the Nurk twins, as I call them, as they called themselves. And um, that is a great session, the 30th of April, 69. The Ballad of John and Yoko is the 14th. And yes. This is the 30th. And uh, it's, again, just the two of them having a brilliant time in the studio, despite everything that goes on outside it. Yeah. I yeah. don't know if Yoko was there for that. Probably she was at both because they weren't apart at this time but um, without a photograph and without hearing her we, we just can't know Fair enough I know you don't like doing what ifs <laughs> Correct uh -oh. <laughs> But you, 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 said, you said that you were in, in sort of 79 you'd offered Sean O'Mahony this, this uh, uh, sort of monthly current what's, what's current, current news and what's going on mm. and uh, Jason is much too young to remember 1979 <laughs> but mm. my memory of late 79 was the Beatles reunion rumours and Campuchia and all of that coming and I have a very vivid memory of reading uh, in Melody Maker on NME a review of the Campuchia concert and they were very scathing about the fact that Lennon hadn't turned up mm. and, 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 and that but and, Knocked for not being somewhere. Yes, right. <laughs> knocked for not being there. But uh, uh, Graham Johnson's, uh, sorry, Graham Thompson's biography of uh, George. He mentions that George and Ringo were lined up to do that. But once the rumor started, they backed off. Is mm -hmm. that I had never read that specifically that they were. You know, I knew that yeah. the public wanted them. The press were baying for it. But that they is that something you're aware of? I've no, I've no inside track on that. It's a Graham Thompson, Thompson having researched it mm. will, will know more about that than yeah. me. So I, I will go with his research on that one if, if he's done that properly, and I'm sure he has. Yeah. Um, 
I was at that concert. Huh. It was Hammersmith Odeon. It was the last days of 1979, mm -hmm. around the 28th or 29th of mm -hmm. December. It was my birthday, 29th of December. 29th, okay. <laughs> Happy birthday. Did, I, did you get my card? <laughs> <clears throat> and um, it was the United Nations. It was for UNICEF, yeah. wasn't it? It was um, Kurt Waldheim. That's it. it was for the boat people of Cambridgeshire. Uh, who were refugees and all these all-star concerts were arranged by Harvey Goldsmith mm. actually I did interview Harvey about it and he didn't say anything about George yeah. Ringo but um, the rumour was that it would be a Beatles reunion mm -hmm. and tickets were hot that night I had a face value ticket bought through the box office but a good friend of mine paid £40 I think it may have even been £50 outside the theatre just to get in that night and that was when £40, £50 yeah, was, was a mm. very significant sum of money it was like how much? because <laughs> the face value of the ticket was two or three pounds yeah. and, um, and right into the night we still expected them to come on mm. Mm. We mm. didn't know that they wouldn't. And in the end, we got Rockestra, which was the only time it was ever done on stage. Yeah, and yeah. it was good. And that Rockestra had a lot of good names in it. I remember Robert Plant was playing Paul's Hoffner bass. bass. I've seen that. That was the photograph on the cover of the NME or Melody Maker, I think. Was, right. Was and Plant and it was Hoffner. the first time I'd ever seen the Hoffner bass because Paul toured through the 70s. He didn't get out the Hoffner bass until he decided to become Bean mm. Paul again mm. in 89. Um, but that's his prerogative. It's his guitar. He can use it. But yeah. that was a conscious thing. When he started using the Hoffner bass again, you knew that it was changing now. And um, so Robert Plant was playing that. It was a great lineup. John Bonham, I think, was on drums. Mm -hmm. And everybody was up there. But it wasn't, it wasn't the John, Beatles. George and Ringo. And it, it was actually a disappointing yeah. gig. And it wasn't one of Wings' better gigs either. It was either. Wings' last gig, wasn't it? Last ever. Yes, performance. and it, it was technically not good. Yeah. Mm. They he had to restart a song once, maybe even twice, and there were gremlins, and it wasn't a happy gig. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Too much pressure, I think. Yeah. And well, Billy Connolly was there. He was the oh, MC, yeah. and he kept saying, they're all here. <laughs> they're all here. The Applejacks, they're all here. <laughs> Which led us on into yeah. thinking they really were there. And they opened, I think, with Got to Get You Into My Life. Yes. So, yeah. so that would, again, I imagine the crowd were suddenly thinking. Well, it was the wing, it was the set that the Wings the, had just yeah. done on that tour, which mm. I'd seen a couple of shows, four shows, I think, by mm. then of that tour. And so he was doing a little bit more Beatles. Yeah. And he also did 20 Flight Rock on that tour, which but, was the best thing for me. But I think it's also in the Graham Thompson book. Doesn't he suggest that uh, John went to see Monty Python in. California in oh, 1980. This is, oh, this is a this is, this a is not the at the Hollywood Bowl. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, this is the Keith Badman book oh, after, Keith Badman. after the Beatles break up, mm -hmm. and he has on the 28th of September, uh, 1980, John doing his final Playboy interview. Mm -hmm. Then he has a haircut. Then he and Yoko get on a jet, fly to LA, see Monty Python at the Hollywood Bowl, meet Derek Taylor, George, and Olivia. George gives John a copy of Somewhere in England, which would have been the pre-rejected version, and then they fly back again. And it's never mentioned anywhere else. But I think everyone else says George didn't speak to John since 74 or 75, something like that, 76. I don't know when they last saw each other exactly. Mm. Um, I would go with the, the Chip Madinger book yeah. on, on John's activities. His activity, it's so detailed. Yeah, yeah. it is, and I don't... I've never There's seen it anywhere about else. about going no. to see the Pythons. No, 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 I've never seen it anywhere else. And um, didn't um, John discuss Faulty Towers in the Andy Peebles interview? Yes. I think he did. So you would think uh, that would... And didn't say anything about it. I've just yeah. seen... No, no, mm. I think, yeah, yeah. It just seemed, seemed a very odd. Well, yeah, I've right. always been curious, you know, the SNL story that John and Paul were watching SNL yeah. uh, uh, one night and they were threatening to go down. Part of me thinks that that might not have happened <laughs> because yeah. Saturday Night Live was regularly in repeats and reruns and was it a real thing you know mm. is, it, is it one of these imagined <coughs> memories is that something that's known to be truly I true think, I think it is it is truly, truly true, true. Okay. yes April 76 yeah. was it yes they, they were at the at the Paul was at the Dakota okay um, probably getting spliffed with John <laughs> and um, in the moment shall we go yeah. Uh, yeah, let's go. And then, you know, yeah. they don't go. Everything kicks in. But I think I think it was possible. Yeah. I do I do believe the story is true. That is a lovely what if. Yeah. You know, if yeah. they just walked on at the end. Um, yeah, and reclaim their eight hundred dollars each <laughs> yes. from Lorne Michaels. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um well look, I know we've covered a lot of things today. Yeah. Um something we're wondering about is long term there must be a Mark Lewis archive that you're putting together. 
And is that something that you've thought about? That, that, that obviously has a huge historical worth and value. Yes, I have thought about it. And um, I mean, I had meant to have done something about it by now, but I still haven't. Mm. Um, I do have an archive. I mean, all Beatle collectors have something and I don't have, everybody's collection is different. My collection is information. Yeah. My collection is about knowledge because it's a collection to support my work. And uh, it's a it's an unrivaled collection, I would say. Yes. And I don't have much of actual intrinsic value, um, pieces of paper that they signed. I don't really have that kind of thing. Mine is a collection of scans, photocopies, photographs of important things. Um, I was always pleased to have a photocopy of a letter. I didn't need to own the original. Mm. Don't have any Beatles autographs still. <laughs> I'm not interested in yeah. them. Um, but I want to know the knowledge. I want the information. And my archive of that is unsurpassed and uh, needs to go somewhere in its entirety intact yeah. and needs to be available for students and historians anybody in the future who wants to try and get the Beatles story right and the Beatles archive is not just the Beatles it's the whole period because mm. I have by collecting everything that they have a connection with um, I have so much of everything that belongs to the 50s 60s and 70s and uh, it really does need to stay together and be available, but I haven't yet worked out where that's going to be or how it's going to be managed. Okay. Mm. Okay. I think that's <laughs> that, that was my final question was about the archive. And right. if you need someone to come and help you, yeah, we'll help obviously you manage through. that or digitize <laughs> that or yeah. just, just, just listen to the tapes. Uh, that, that, that would right. be happy to do that. I have an abundance of everything. I mean, absolutely huge amounts of everything. In fact, I've just moved and presently my archive is in storage and... Uh, there was a, a weighing scale on the forklift truck that lifted all my stuff <laughs> onto its um, place where it's resting at the moment. And that isn't even all my office, but um, they told me that it weighed 13.2 tonnes. Ooh, wow. We're all very worried about that archive. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah it, it, it must stay together and it must be available. And, mm. it, and it must be available in the right spirit, mm. um, free of charge. Yes. To anybody who needs it. And I suppose ultimately it needs to be online, but... The, how something of this magnitude can ever be online would take could take a, a, a team of people years to well, this, get this is what I'm saying it's, it's, it's in the nature of uh, your work is is that of a historian it's not really a biography it's mm. it's it's more than that and it's a social history as well yes um, we were saying earlier that the the first volume is how the world around them influenced the Beatles and then the succeeding volumes mm. will inevitably be how the Beatles influenced the world yes uh, in turn yes um, so it's an academic resource, really. Mm, it is very much an academic resource. Yeah. Yes, it's not just about hey, I like the Beatles. It's going to <laughs> yes, go and have a look. Of paper. Or, yeah. I mean, I have substantial runs of office files for Brian Epstein, and some of that is about the Beatles, and other, bit, other bits are about Brian, and about promoters and managers and clubs in the sixties, and the licensing of clubs, and really deep level, mm. deep level reference material um, that could satisfy almost infinite variety of inquiries in the future so by any kind of um, applicant. So you're looking for a university or an academic institution that would... Uh, mm, probably. Mm. Probably. And I'd quite like it to stay in the UK. Sure. Mm. Um, but the money is in America and it needs money, a project like mm. that, to actually... It needs Because I've been to some uni British university archives where they take on somebody's collection and mostly they just sit in a back room. Yeah. Yes. And rather, this should be something that is openly embraced and open, just open. Hmm. Okay. Well, Mark, we cannot thank you enough for coming in and talking to us today. It's Have a go. <laughs> go on, try. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you so much. <laughs> uh, it's been absolutely illuminating. And I think on behalf of all fans, we're very lucky to have you. Um, thank you for everything that you've done over the years. Uh, you know, when we started this podcast, we talked about how it's not just fun listening to the Beatles, it's fun reading about the Beatles, finding out about the Beatles, going deeper and deeper all the time. You know, yeah. I think when we started doing this podcast, we wondered, would we start hating the Beatles? And we don't. It just gets deeper and deeper and you go on and on and on. And it's uh, fascinating. You can thing. only hate the Beatles if you've got hate in your hearts. 
that's a very nice way of putting it I think you're right mm. and uh, so on behalf of all the fans thank you and thank you for coming in uh, to talk to us today and we hope uh, you'll be back in Dublin very very soon I will I'm sure I will Brilliant. thank you thank, thank you very you. much so yes we thank Mark Lewson for coming in to join us today and uh, that was a fascinating conversation Stephen wouldn't you say yes uh, I never thought we'd have access to uh, <laughs> Mark Lewison and, uh, but yes fascinating absolutely fascinating uh, and so um, we remain online in the normal places if you want to get in touch with us we're on Twitter at Beatles Pod we're on Facebook look for the Nothing Is Real Facebook group and Stephen will let you join um, please leave all your regular reviews and five star uh, exclamation points uh, in whatever podcast app that you're using at the minute um, but for Nothing Is Real I'm Jason Carty I'm Stephen Cockcroft and we will see you next time thanks very much Thank you.